All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be doing section 6.2 star, which is all about the natural logarithmic function. Um, this section and the next couple are going to be some interesting sections, actually, because in these sections, we're going to start by introducing the natural logarithmic function, and then we're going to derive the natural exponential function from that one. So it's a little bit different than what you might have seen in the past. Let me go ahead and pull up the slides, and let's get started. All right, so like I said, this is section 6.2 star, and we're gonna be doing 6.2, 3, and 4 star. So you don't need to do the sections 6.2, 6.3, 6.4 without the star. You, the book has both with and without the stars, uh, and here at Santa Monica College, we use the ones with the stars because we start with the natural logarithmic function. So what we're gonna talk about first is just how this is a little bit of a different approach, but it's kind of a cool approach because you get a lot of cute results and a lot of elegant results as well. Um, so then we'll define the natural logarithmic function. We'll talk about properties of this function. We'll talk about the number e. We'll do some examples, and then we'll finish off with logarithmic differentiation, which is basically a, a differentiation technique that uses logarithms that can make it easier, depending on what the function looks like. All right, so um, you definitely saw exponential and logarithmic functions back in pre-calculus or in algebra class. Uh, usually what you'll do is the exponential function will be defined first, and then you'll define the logarithmic function as its inverse. So here we're going to explore a different approach, and what we're going to do is we're going to first define the natural logarithmic function as an integral, and then from that we're going to produce the natural exponential function from this definition. Um, like I'd mentioned, uh, this, this approach is a little bit different, but it's, uh, it's pretty elegant because it involves a really cool use of the fundamental theorem of calculus, and it provides an elegant proof that the function e to the x is continuous at all of the irrational numbers. And when I say e to the x, I mean e, where e is that number, that irrational number that we'll talk about later today. Um, that's about 2.71828 and so on. Um, so this approach is a bit different than what you've seen in the past, but this is also a good time to practice using a formal definition instead of just intuition to derive a series of results. So a lot of people will say that if you define the exponential function first, it's an intuitive thing. It's intuitive to describe it. And then from that, you get the logarithmic function. Uh, but it's not always good to just rely on intuition when you want to build new mathematics. You really do need some rigor. And sometimes enforcing that rigor provides more elegant results. So um, this is good practice right now for this, and we're going to need that formal way of thinking when we get to sequences and series, and a lot of your work is going to be essentially proofs and writing proofs. All right, so here we go. Let's start with just the definition. So we define the natural logarithmic function as this integral. So it is the integral from 1 to x, let me get my little laser here, from 1 to x of the function 1 over t. And this is for all x greater than 0. So one thing I want to point out first and foremost, because this is something you probably haven't seen before, we are defining this function, ln of x, as this integral here. So for now, pretend you don't know anything else about the natural logarithmic function, that you've never seen logs before in your life. Just forget all that stuff from the past and pretend that this is all you know right now. Uh, this, is, this is the new definition of the logarithm for us, all right? Okay. Uh, so a couple of things about it. Um, for one, recall that this function, the function 1 over t, it's continuous for all t greater than 0. And also recall that the integral of a continuous function always exists. So this is an important point. This is an important point because we're trying to define a function as an integral, but we can't define that function as that integral unless we are certain that that integral always exists for every x. So in this case, it does because the function 1 over t is continuous for t greater than 0. So therefore, this integral exists for all x greater than 0. And that means that we can define our function ln of x as this integral safely. It's well defined. Everything is good. We can continue. Um, the other thing, just to remind you, if you haven't looked at these in a little while, this type of integral is what I like to call an area so far function. So it's important to note that the input of this function ln of x is this upper bound, the upper bound of integration. And so what we're doing is we're letting this upper bound of integration change. And what this function tells us is the area underneath this curve 
from one to whatever that value of X is. That's what it is. So the integral is an area so far function. Okay, so let's look at a picture just to really like hammer that point home and make it intuitive here. So this function ln of X is the area so far under the function one over T from one to X. And this is basically a picture of it. So we're defining the natural log of X literally to be this area. All right, so what I want you to do now is, um, uh, maybe you can guess, just take a minute to stare at this definition and stare at this picture and just ponder it for a minute, all right? <clears throat> All right, now say something out loud to yourself about what you're thinking involving this definition. Remember, you don't have to say it to anybody. It could, it could just be to yourself or your dog or the wall or your cat or whoever. Just something verbally out loud so your brain gets that feedback. All right, so one thing I'll point out because we're gonna see this on the next slide. Notice that this integral is defined for all x greater than zero but the integral goes from one to x, right? So the picture you're looking at right now is for when x is greater than one. So when x is greater than one, this is the picture. If x is between zero and one, this is what the picture looks like. So we're still integrating underneath this curve, and this is the area we're talking about. But notice that because x is coming before one, we can switch the order of these bounds but when we switch the order of the bounds, it changes the sign of the integral, if you remember that from, from Calc 1. Um, so what that means is that this does actually agree with what we were thinking, what we know about the log function from pre-calculus, that when x is between 0 and 1, this integral is actually going to be negative. It's going to be the opposite of this area right here. There you go. All right. So... First, we get a couple cute results. So here's the first cute result that is a very quick and easy one. The natural log of one is zero, boom. And it's a, it's a single statement, single line proof. Uh, just by definition of the natural log function, ln of one is the integral from one to one of that function one over t. And if you're integrating from a point to itself, then the area under the curve is zero. So natural log of one, is zero. Next, we get this really cute result. This is one of my favorites here. Um, the derivative of the natural log function is one over x. And we'll get this instantly. So <laughs> by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, if we're differentiating this function ln of x, what we're really doing is we're differentiating this integral. But FTC one says that if you differentiate this integral, what you get is you get the inside function evaluated at the upper bound. So in particular, we're gonna get one over x. Yay, pretty cool. So the derivative of ln of x is one over x. All right, then we get all of these nice properties. So remember for right now, we don't know anything else about natural logs. You don't know the laws of logarithms. You don't know the laws of exponentials and so on and so on. Um, we're gonna prove those. So here's the, the first one we're gonna prove. If x and y are positive real numbers, and r is a rational number, then we get these three properties of logarithms. The product to sum, the quotient to difference, and then this one, which lets you pull out powers, pull out exponents. Um, we're gonna prove number one. We're gonna prove number one, and then I'm gonna leave the other two for you to do as an exercise, so you can try those on your own. The arguments are very similar to the argument that I'll make here for number one. And I also want to point out that we will remove the restriction that R is rational in the next section, in the next section. That's actually one of the reasons this method or this approach is, is elegant, because that just kind of falls out, as you'll see in the next section. All right, let's prove number one. So first, uh, just let A be any positive real number that you want. And we're going to consider a related function, the function ln of A times X. So we're going to look at this function for a minute first. Now, by the chain rule, if we differentiate this function, we get 1 over ax times a, which is equal to 1 over x, right? We just showed that the derivative uh, of, of ln of x is 1 over x. So by the chain rule, we get this. Now, the interesting thing here is this. The derivative of this function is 1 over x, and the derivative of the natural log function is also 1 over x. 
So these two functions have the same derivative. And what that means is that these two functions can only differ by a constant. That's a result from calc one. So basically if two functions have the same derivative, then they can only be vertical shifts of one another. Having the same derivative means the, slopes of the, the slope of the tangent line is the same for both functions. But if that's the case, then that means that both functions can only be vertical shifts of each other. So in particular, we can write this. We can write this. We can say that ln of a times x is equal to ln of x plus some number k, some real number k that we don't necessarily know. All right, now we have this set up. So if we plug in x equals 1, then ln of ax becomes ln of a, and ln of x becomes ln of 1. But like we just showed, the natural log of 1 is equal to 0. And so what this calculation shows us is that ln of a must be equal to k. So what is that constant? What is that, that shift from the natural log function? It is natural log of a, whatever that value is. Therefore, we can write ln of a times x is equal to ln of x plus ln of a. Now, because we chose a to be an arbitrary positive number, this holds true for any positive real number. So more generally, we can just say this, that the natural log of x times y is ln of x plus ln of y, where x and y are positive numbers. Boom. That's it. So now we have that first law of logarithms that you can turn a, a product into a sum of logarithms, which is nice. OK. Uh, here is a graph of the log function. So this should look familiar from a class like pre-calculus or algebra. Uh, this is the graph of the log function itself. This is not the graph of 1 over x. This is the graph of the log function. So notice that uh, ln of 1 is 0. And then when x is between 0 and 1, the natural logarithm is, uh, the output is negative. And then when x is greater than 1, the output is positive. Just like that. All right, other properties. So here's the first one. It turns out that this function, the natural log of x, is continuous. And my question to you is, why? Why do we know that this function is continuous? Think about it for a moment. All right, say something out loud. Why do you think it's continuous? All right, let's see why. So there's a couple of reasons, but the first one is just by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if you go and review the fundamental theorem of calculus, you'll see that that integral, that area so far function is continuous when f is continuous. <laughs> so it's given to us by the fundamental theorem of calculus, but maybe even a more um, satisfying answer is that we, we showed that this function is differentiable. We computed its derivative. The derivative of ln of x is one over x. And remember that if your function is differentiable, that means it's also continuous. So we get continuity through that result as well. All right, so it is continuous. Now, because it's continuous, this is a handy thing because that means that it's continuous, well, I should say this, it's continuous for any, on any interval where a is bigger than zero and less than b. So it's continuous on any closed interval there. And because it's continuous on that closed interval, that means that the intermediate value theorem applies. So that's something you can go and look back in, um, oh geez, what section is it? I think it's section uh, 1.8 where you first talk about continuity in this book. But I recommend reviewing it. Go check out the intermediate value theorem, which basically says that if you're continuous on a closed interval, then if you pick any point in the, the output, any point in the range, there must be a number in the domain that maps to that point in the range. And that's kind of what I'm saying right here, just in a very specific way. So what this means is the intermediate value, the, the intermediate value theorem tells us that there is some number in the domain of the natural log function where the output will be equal to one. So basically there's some point here where the area under that curve, the area under this curve from one to some number, that this area will be equal to one, guaranteed. That's guaranteed by the intermediate value theorem. So that number, 
that makes this area equal to one is a very special number and we call it the number E. So E is by definition, the number that makes the area under that curve equal to one. So it's the number such that the natural log of that number is equal to one. And we know that that number exists by the intermediate value theorem. So we just give it a, a special name. We give it the, the name E. So yeah, E is the X value where the area under the curve is equal to one. So it's basically this. That is how E is defined. All right, cool, huh? <laughs> so now we know that that number E is a real number. It exists. We know exactly what it's doing. We know exactly where it's located. It's right here. And we've got all that. Okay. Let's do some examples now. So we know how to differentiate the log function. So let's try to do this one. See if you can do this one on your own and then we'll do it together. So think about how you would start. What would you, what would you do to start this? All right, now say something out loud about how you would start it. What would you do first? What would you use? All right, and then work it out on your own. Compute the derivative, see what you get, and we'll do it together in just a moment. All right, here we go. So we've got a composition of functions, so we're definitely gonna have to use the chain rule. So by the chain rule, we get a very quick calculation. We're gonna get one over sine of x times the derivative of sine, which is cosine. So we get cosine x over sine x, which is cotangent cotangent of x. All right, how about another one? Try to compute this one on your own. So think about how you would do it and then try to work it out on your own. All right, work it out on your own if you haven't started already and then we'll pick up with you in just a moment. All right, here we go. So looks like we might have to use, let's see. Well, we could use the chain rule and the quotient rule, but now that we have these properties of logs, we could use them to make our life a little bit easier, right? So remember, we know that this is log of a quotient. So properties of logarithms say that we can split that up into a difference of logs. So this is equal to this. Now, if we wanna differentiate this, we can differentiate this difference instead. We can even, uh, we can even pull down the, the exponent that corresponds to this square root, pull that down as a, a power of one half, pull it to the front. Then the derivatives are not so bad, right? What's the derivative of natural log x plus one? You gotta use the chain rule again, but you get one over x plus one. And then the derivative of this, very similar, you're just gonna get one half times one over x minus two. And that is the derivative. That is the derivative. If you instead use the quotient rule, you should arrive at something equivalent. So if what you have from the quotient rule looks a bit different, try to massage it a little bit until you get it to look exactly like this, because they should be the same. All right, let's do another one. So this one's kind of interesting. Uh, let's find the derivative of the natural log of absolute value of x. And for this one, uh, I want you to think about how you would do it at first, and then we'll do it together. All right, let's work on this one together. So pretty much this, I always tell my students this in all of my classes, if you involve an absolute value, at some point you're gonna just have to go to the definition of absolute value. That's pretty much what it is. With absolute value, it always boils down to those two cases, one where x or the input is negative and one where the input is positive. So using the definition of absolute value and considering the fact that the domain of the log function is all the positives, we get this. So this is how the natural log of absolute value of x is defined. So remember, if x is positive, absolute value of x is just x. If x is negative, absolute value of x is the opposite of x. So this is what our function looks like. And if we want to compute its derivative, then we need to also notice that this, this function is not defined at zero. So natural log of x is not defined at zero. So it's only defined greater than zero or less than zero. So if we want to compute the derivative, we're going to compute the two separate cases separately. <laughs> so 
when this is what we have, the derivative of ln of x is just 1 over x. When this is what we have, when we take the derivative, we have to use the chain rule. So we get 1 over negative x times negative 1, which gives us 1 over x again. So <laughs> it turns out that the derivative of ln of absolute value of x is just equal to 1 over x for all x not equal to 0. All x not equal to 0. Nice. So using FTC1 again, we end up with the following corollary that the integral of the function 1 over x is equal to ln of x plus c for all x not equal to 0. And again, this is kind of a cool result. It's, it's really fun how all of this stuff just falls out <laughs> of that definition of logarithm, right? But now think about this function 1 over x. 1 over x is defined everywhere except for 0. And if we want to compute an antiderivative of that function, then it's going to be natural log of absolute value of x plus c. Because if you differentiate the log of absolute value of x plus any constant, you will get 1 over x. That's what we just showed. So it's like another pretty cute result. Lots of cute results in this, in this section. <laughs> All right. So now try to do this one. Uh, this might be a little bit of a reach back to the right at the end of Calc 1. But this one I want you to try to do on your own. See if you can evaluate this integral. Think about it first. And then say something out loud about how you would do it. And then take a crack at it. See if you can compute that integral. All right, let's do this one together. Uh, one of the things we'll learn more in this class is we're going to learn a ton of integration techniques. So that'll be later in chapter seven. In chapter seven, we're going to learn tons of integration techniques. For now, you don't really have too many. You have the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, and you've got u substitution or just the substitution rule. And that's what we're going to use here. So we're going to let u be equal to x squared plus one. Then when we take the derivative of that, we get that du is equal to 2x dx. Now we've already got x in the integral and we've already got dx in the integral. So we just need to modify our result by a factor of two or a factor of one half, I should say. So then we can rewrite this integral as one half times the integral of one over u du. But hey, we know what the integral of one over u du is now. It's the natural log of absolute value of u. Then we can substitute back in. We have, it, we have an indefinite integral. So if we started with x's, then we need to end with x's. We can't, we can't stop at u's because we've got an indefinite integral. So we're going to plug in our substitution again, x squared plus 1. And now one last step is uh, we could actually remove the absolute value bars because x squared plus 1 is always positive. It's always positive. So its absolute value is just going to be that value again, spit back out. All right, this is great because now we have ways of dealing with, uh, with integrating ratios of things. So if we can essentially get our, our rational function to be nice enough, then we can keep using this, uh, this integral of 1 over x over and over again. OK, now let's talk about logarithmic differentiation. So the idea here is that those properties of logarithms can help us differentiate complicated functions functions that are made up of a lot of products, quotients, and powers. This won't necessarily help if your function has a lot, of, uh, a lot of terms. Like if it's got a bunch of sums and differences in it that are all separated, then this technique may not be so helpful. But if you've got a pretty gnarly function that's a lot of stuff multiplied and divided and exponentiated, logarithmic differentiation can help out a lot. So we're going to try it here. Um, actually, let me see here. Yeah, yeah, let me, let me, well, okay, let me give you this thing to think about, and then we'll do this one together. Um, think about how you could use the law of the laws of logarithms to split this expression apart. So think about that first, and then we'll pick up and do this together. All right, here we go. Here's the, here's the technique. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to take the log of both sides. So we know that y is equal to that. So let's take the log of both sides. Then we get that ln of y is equal to all of this. And this is actually what we get 
when we apply the laws of logarithms to this expression. So that's why those laws are so handy because they can turn things like products and quotients and powers into sums and differences and multiples. That's what we've got here. And then all of these are gonna be simpler to integrate, right? Or I'm sorry, simpler to differentiate or to integrate, frankly, <laughs> or to integrate. Uh, but we don't know the integral of log yet. We'll get that, um, we'll get that later. <laughs> but uh, for now, we can differentiate. So what are we gonna do next? We're going to differentiate both sides implicitly with respect to x. So when we differentiate natural log of y with respect to x, we get one over y times dy dx. And then differentiating the other side is basically just using what we proved earlier and the chain rule. So uh, derivative of this is this, derivative of this is this, and the derivative of this is this. There we go. Now we can simplify a little bit, massage things a little bit, make it a little bit cleaner. Uh, we can solve for dy dx by multiplying everything by y, and we get this result. So that's what it looks like a little more simplified. Now we have an explicit expression for y. It's given right here. So our final result is going to look like this. This is what that derivative is. <laughs> there we go. So what is the derivative of this thing? it is equal to this down here. Yay, there we go. Um, one thing I'll add at the end, now that we see how complicated this derivative looks, you could arrive at the same result simply by using the quotient rule and the product rule and the chain rule and the power rule here. You just have to be very, very careful with your calculations. But if you didn't want to go through that, you could use logarithmic differentiation and you will end up at the same result. You should arrive at an equivalent result. So if you're curious, try it out on your own. See if you want to try to differentiate that using the older differentiation techniques and see if you get the same thing. It'll be quite an exercise in algebra though. So just a, just a fair warning about that. All right, so on that note, let's play. I'm excited to do the activity about this when we meet, um, but that's it for this section. We just learned about the natural logarithm. So next time we'll talk about the natural exponential function. And we're going to get that from what we already got today. All right, so I'll stop rambling and I'll see you all next time.